Postcards from a Dying World, the podcast. For more than a decade, I've reviewed over 1,000 books that are mostly science fiction, horror, and bizarro. This feed will feature bonus audio I have produced over the years, as well as a monthly digest of reviews based on what I've read each month, plus the occasional bonus material about my own fiction. Thanks for listening. Hello and welcome to Postcards from a Dying World. Uh, this is becoming, this is the second annual Best of Horror Halloween episode. Last year, uh, Desmond Reddick of Dread Media, Mother Horror, Sadie, Sadie Mother Horror, and uh, James Chambers joined me to do Best Horror Novels. This year, we're doing the best or our favorite uh, horror short stories. And I've pulled together, I shouldn't say best, I should say favorite. Um, I've pulled together a panel of people that I've been thinking about for a year that th these are the people that I wanted to have um, on this particular panel. So I've thought about this long and hard. And one of the people that I love talking about horror short stories with is uh, returning to the podcast is Laird Barron, who is an award-winning author of many books, my favorite being the Isaiah Coleridge trilogy, which I've covered on this podcast before. So if you want to hear more about my opinion on those books, you can go back and hear Laird and I nerd out about that. So welcome to the show, Laird. Thank you. And um, also joining me, um, uh, I'm very honored to have her for the first time on the show, is Mary San Giovanni, who is also an award-winning horror and thriller writer. Um, my favorite being the Hollower trilogy uh, was is one that um, I really, really, really love. And her Kathy Ryan series uh, is another good one. I love Chills. It was a great book. Um, and she was a one-time co-host of The Horror Show with Brian Keene and also Cosmic Shenanigans and currently the Ghost Writers podcast. And uh, I wanted to have Mary on because uh, she constantly uh, basically had the best, most thought, thought out opinions on horror fiction uh, on the horror show. And so, um, and, and where she got the nickname, The Professor. So uh, we wanted to have Mary on here too. But if we're going to have a professor, we should also have a judge, right? And so um, one of my longest running friends in the world, 30 years we've been friends, uh, Mark Rothenberg is the guy, when I nerd out about horror fiction, he's the guy that I do it with. We were housemates um, probably 30 years ago when he was in college and I was in my gap year. And I remember distinctly having a huge argument about whether the, the further books of Necroscope beyond book three were worth a shit. So, and well, we both agreed on that, but I think it was whether, whether three was worth a shit still is what we argued a lot Agreed. about. Agreed. Yeah. And so joining us is Mark Rothenberg, representing the readers. So um, a serious horror nerd. I'm uh, really glad to have Mark here. Welcome to the show, Mark. And hey, thanks. Really appreciate it. All right. So we're going to start with five honorable mentions. And I'm going to do my honorable mentions first. And then uh, we'll go Mary, Laird, and Mark for the honorable mentions. And... With the honorable mentions, these are stories that almost made the list, didn't quite make the list, but the criteria that I use for picking my list are my favorite stories, and not necessarily the best stories, or um, some of them, like, for example, you'll see, like, definitely, I think there's better stories by a given author, but I picked one that hit me personally the hardest, and a good example of that is the first of my honorable mentions, which is Buried in the Sky by John Shirley. John Shirley is one of my absolute favorite writers on the planet, so it's funny that he only gets into the honorable mentions, but um, this is a tough list. And Buried in the Sky is a great combination of all of his skills. It's a Lovecraftian story, but it's also a little bit cyberpunk and sci-fi, and it's collected in Living Shadows, but I believe it was originally published in Weird Book um, magazine. But Buried in the Sky takes place, it's about... Um, like a, a very tall skyscraper city type um, future at like living space that's supposed to be getting around climate change. And then there's also Lovecraftian gods. And it's a really great story that combines Lovecraftian stuff with cyberpunk. So I really love Buried in the Sky by John Shirley. Um, he is still pumping out short story collections. His newest one, Feverish Stars, is great. 
and he continues to write uh, political and awesome science fiction. So that uh, Buried in the Sky by John Trudeau, my number 15. Number 14 is a story from 1928. It's The Miracle of the Lily by Claire Winger Harris. And I know nothing about this author. I just know that this story was in The Future's Female, edited by Lisa Yazik, who um, this is a collection of the best pulp era science fiction written by women. And this story is a post-apocalyptic story about human beings eradicating insects and how the whole ecosystem falls apart. And it was written in 1928. It's fucking incredible um for 1928 and this entire book is really great i know i'm biased because lisa yazik has been on my other podcast De- uh, dickheads like six times and i love lisa but this book is really great and it's the reason why she got on my radar was this awesome book and we will have another story from that on my list but uh that's miracle of the lily uh, the next one is a novella i'm not going to say too much about is Far Side of the De- Cadillac Desert with Dead Folks by Joe R. Lansdale. And I, it's iffy because it's a novella and I wasn't sure if, if novellas counted, but it was in a short story collection, uh, Book of the Dead, that I first discovered it. It was the first time I ever wrote Joe R. Lansdale. It blew my mind. Um, I was in eighth or ninth grade when I read it and I was like, oh, wait, people from Texas can write kick-ass horror too. Um, and so I really loved that. The next one, Laird, I might have to ask Laird to comment on it because he wrote the introduction to this collection, which is Philip Fricazzi's, um Behold the Void, and the story is Failsafe, which I'm sure there's better. Fricazzi has written more intense, more like, I don't know, just this story. It's very simple horror story that just captured me and it has white knuckle moments. It has little twists and turns. And so, and it just really kicked my butt. And it's the one that made me say for is as an author, I want to watch and follow was that story in particular. So that's fail safe. And then my last honorable mention, and then we get to move on is the storm by David Morell. Uh, who's the author of First Blood uh, and Creepers and a lot of great stuff. And he's really underrated as a horror short story author. He has a couple classics. Um, He has that one about art. I can't remember the title, but anyways, the storm is super simple. And I think it would make an incredible episode of an anthology series like Creepshow or Masters of Horror. It's a very simple concept. It's just a guy driving and there's a storm that keeps coming and he can't outrun the storm and he keeps trying to outrun it and it never stops coming. And it's really simple, but gosh, it's really well done. So that's uh, the storm by David Morrell. And that is the last of my honorable mentions. Mary, would you like to do your honorable mentions? Sure. Uh, Now the criteria that I used for picking both the honorable mentions and my top 10 stories Uh, I try to find that sort of weird meeting place between stories that I thought had a significant impact on the genre, but more so stories that had a significant impact on me as a writer. And some of these I read long before I started writing. I read them as as a reader. But I think that uh, overall, they're my favorites because they left this sort of lasting impression on me in terms of what I would want to do someday when I'm a grown up writer, you know, <laughs> that, that I, the things that I would like to be able to do with my fiction, I feel that these stories do, either being particularly shocking or just, you know, beautifully written or uh, emotionally, you know, like very impactful emotionally, that kind of thing, you know, just, just stories that I felt just kind of got me in the feels or got me in the gut one way or another. So my honorable mentions, uh, I start backwards. Number five is A Rose for Emily by William Faulkner. I read this in college and it was, it struck me immediately as a precursor to Psycho. I mean, it was, it was the story Psycho before Psycho, which I thought was kind of cool. It's basically about this, this old woman, Emily, who is sort of a a spinster type and lives in her house. And it's told from the point of view of the townspeople, kind of like, um, 
I, I can't think of the, the, there's another story like that where it's told from sort of the outside and it, it's told uh, about Emily and what people thought of her and how, when, well, see, I'm trying to, trying to avoid uh, spoilers, but at some point they have an occasion to learn more about who Emily really is. And the truth is a lot more disturbing and tragic than what they thought. Mm. Uh, number four is The Monkey's Paw by W.W. Jacobs. This story, I think, <clears throat> if, if you are remotely superstitious in any way, or if you are, you know, if you, if, if you have any kind of inclination, I think, in any way toward the supernatural, I think this, this story can't help but, but move you in some way. Because it is... It, it, it takes a basic human need. I mean, from from the time we're little kids, even when we're even when we're taught to blow out birthday candles, we're we're always told to make a wish. You know, make a wish, and you 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 throw a penny into a well. You know, make a wish on the first star you see at night. You know, make a wish when you blow your candles out. Making a wish is something that we we associate with uh, a sort of childlike, innocent desire for something. And this story, it just messes with that entirely it, it just it, it finds the the truly horrific outcome of just about any wish that you can think of in in its suggestiveness of what you know in in the three wishes that are made and granted in this particular story the next one uh number three i picked the damn thing by ambrose Bierce, and i picked this one Partly because when I read it, I was young enough to giggle at the fact that they used damned in the title, but mostly it was because <laughs> <laughs> mostly it was because I I thought that it was the first time that I had really read horror and recognized that you could incorporate humor in it and not have that humor detract from something truly disturbing. And uh, the humor part, I think, is more in the um, the inquest that. Uh, begins the story and ends the story more or less because the story of the damned thing is testimony given at, um, at this dead man's uh, inquest by the, the men that are, you know, sort of trying to determine cause of death. And there is a little bit of humor in it, but there's also this underlying horror, not just of uh, that what you can't see can hurt you, but also how stubborn people are and willing to cover up something even even if the truth is obvious and i i always found that like a a really sort of clever way of uh portraying horror on on a multiple level you know and, and speaking of multiple levels number two is <laughs> and again like like david i'm not sure if this is a novella i don't think it is i think it actually falls short word count wise of a novella, but it's Mrs. God by Peter Straub. Uh, I love Peter's work. I would like to believe that I'm smart enough to get all of it, but I'm not. <laughs> um, there, there are some things that, because I, I know that Peter found Robert Aikman to be an influence and Robert Aikman's work is incredibly subtle. Uh, we'll it is coming that, back to Aikman in the, in, uh, the list. Oh, good, good. Cause I mean, I, I like Aikman's work, but it is very subtle and it is, it is more of the suggestion of something that is wrong. It's, it's, you know what it is? It's that feeling when you can't quite put your finger on it. You know something's bothering you, but you're not quite sure what it is. Sometimes that's worse than a horror that you, you can confront because it's a lingering kind of thing. And Mrs. God is that kind of a story. Uh, it's basically about, a, a, I would say, a writer's retreat, but I believe there are other creatives there. And about the deconstruction of a man uh, who really just is both unwilling and in some ways unable to recognize the limitations that are ultra ultimately detrimental to him. Um, and then of course, number one, I think I, I mentioned it before is the lottery by Shirley Jackson. This was the first story I'd ever read <laughs> that had a level of brutality in it that I didn't know that you could really put into fiction. I mean, I read it probably in, in school. Uh, I'm trying to think the first time I read it might've been high school maybe. Um, 
And a lot of times, you know, you read stuff and it's like, oh, this is this is for school. How good could it be? And I read this. And I was like, wow, this this is a horror story, you know, and and it was and it's a horror story with a level of violence that is both somehow graphically horrific and yet l literary and subtle and and done not just for the gratuitous use of violence, but to really put something across. And again, this is another story that I think um, portrays a certain stubbornness of the human spirit that um, in some ways in horror is a good thing, but in this particular way in horror is a bad thing. That inability to buck traditions and having, you know, come from a, an, a Irish Catholic background, you know, Italian and Irish Catholic background, the idea of tradition is a big deal. Um, both uh, more, maybe more so on the Italian side than the Irish side, but, but I, I mean, I was raised with traditions on both sides and the thought that a tradition, something that you've always trusted to be okay. And your parents have always trusted to be okay. And your grandparents have always trusted and all of your neighbors have always trusted to be okay. That maybe it's not okay. Uh, is, is both illuminating and, and a little scary. And, and then to find out that it can be outright, not just not okay, but outright destructive and violent to your own community, I think was, it was very eye-opening. So those were my honorable mentions. All right, Laird, you're up next. All right, well, thank you for that. It was great. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna keep it pretty brief uh, since this is the honorable section for me. Um, my criteria overall, a couple of things. Uh, one uh, is I realize that it's, as you have said, a couple times now, it, it really isn't a best of list. It is a representative uh, list. I actually like how David Hartwell and Catherine Kramer have always talked about their, and Gardner Desois talked about their best of the years. The best that we have read this year that we could get a hold of and, and, and put in front of you. There's, it's a snapshot. Uh, because I realize that there's so many authors. Mm. Th there's no Lucia Shepard on my list. There's no uh, Peter Straub on my list. They belong on every list. So what this is, is a list of things that have affected me that are representative of things. Also, I wanted to enlarge with, with at least a handful of my selections, uh, the idea of what horror can do or, or how it can manifest, because this is sort of a recommendation kind of a panel as opposed to, nope, these are the, these are, this is set in stone. These are the, this is the Bible. No, this is just, I, I'd like to demonstrate, Hey, with a couple of my picks here and there that I, I think this is horror as well. Uh, and the third, is uh, that kind of constrained me a little bit as I know a lot of people in the business. I, yeah. I don't know anybody on this list very well at all. I, I may have, been, I may have to, Michael Shea is the exception, uh, but I'm damn well going to make the exception for him. So there's no, there's no John Langan on this list. Mm -hmm. There's no yeah. Brian Evanson on this list. There are people that I've just, I feel like I'm probably too close to that probably deserve to be on the list. So with that. Um, yeah. I broke I that rule a little bit. But I will say, uh, onto what you were saying, I, I made a list of the authors I couldn't believe were not in mine. Right. You, Laird, um, Harlan Ellison, Richard Matheson, Charles Beaumont, Dennis Atchison, Poppy Z. Bright. I, like, afterwards, when I realized that those names weren't on there, it was just like, whoa. Well, right, yeah, and my list became much easier for me because <laughs> I, I wrote this list several times, actually. And once I realize this is not a best of as much as it is these are great stories but you know what ask me next week and i have 15 different stories it became a lot easier uh, but without without further delay yes sorry. <laughs> um there are more things uh by borges uh, which you can find uh actually most of these you can find them i think online uh if, if you poke around but uh it was re it was published in 75 uh it appeared in the book of was collected in the book of sand um and it's basically and i'm not sure whether it's sarcastic or not but it's essentially borges doing his riff on lovecraft it's a re it's a response to lovecraft's indescribable horrors and i won't say much more about that but it's just it's basically uh back in the days when people cared about such things friend of the a friend of the pov character uh has, has passed on and there's some changes being made to the house that he had made for him and the POV character doesn't like it. And especially when he goes there and finds out that 
there are very, very strange alterations being made. Uh, and then, as they say, the murders began. Uh, number four, the Circular Valley, Paul Bowles. Now, Paul Bowles, very few people, as with Borges, you know, you're not going to get anybody thinking these guys are horror writers. Uh, but I think Paul Bowles in particular, for me, uh, is more of a horror writer in the sense that he evokes the horrific, much like Cormac McCarthy would be another example, than almost any intentional or, or genre branded horror author. Uh, and the Circular Valley is one of the few, and I, ha I have not read all of Paul Bowles, but I have read a slew of Paul Bowles short fiction. And this is the most overtly supernatural story of his that I've, that, that I've encountered. Uh, and basically it just takes place up in the mountains. And it's one of my favorite kinds of stories. You don't see enough of it. Um, it's the, it's the uh, genius loci story, the spirit of the place. Uh, and there is a being, it's this ancient being. Uh, you get the sense that it's probably not necessarily uh, sort of like a, you know, a non-material incorporeal creature that can inhabit uh, other beings and control them and experience uh, their life and their deaths. And it ends up encountering, uh, it kind of haunts this old abandoned ruins of a monastery and it takes a liking to a mortal uh, human who shows up with her lover. Uh, they're having an affair and uh, it learns of treachery and heartbreak. And I think it's just a, fa it's a fascinating uh, literary example of horror leads into number three, uh, I think this is a time-honored classic. Uh, I'm not sure how many people consider it horror. I certainly do. A Good Man is Hard to Find by Flannery O'Connor. <laughs> and by the way, you, you're going to get the Paul Bowles story, The Circular Valley, uh, uh, in The Delicate Prey. Uh, that's, an easy, that's an easy collection to pick it up in. Uh, so A Good Man is Hard to Find. It's going to be in her, one of her major collections. It's, it's online. Uh, and I guess I would characterize that as a reason I picked it is it's a super example of uh, the evil that men do uh, and, the, and that women do. And it also is really an instructive that there are different gradations of, of evil uh, and, and how basically if evil is sort of this stream or a river, it's this raw, almost pr primal force. Uh, it also has branches and tributaries that are not always apparent as being as stemming from the, ma the main body of it uh and and how ultimately though they all they all um curve back into the into the central body of it uh that's one of my favorite stories i think it's it's beautifully written and it's it's just utterly chilling and it's almost banal treatment of uh, a massacre uh the bloody chamber angela carter uh, I love Angela Carter. You know, when I was younger, I loved fairy tales. As an adult, uh, I am less sanguine about the endless redoing of fairy tales. I think it's easy target to try to, to rewrite Rumpelstiltskin, but it's hard to pull it off. Angela Carter, I think, not to pun, but she wrote the book on, no, I'll, I'll show you how you, re how you redo fairy tales. The Bloody Chamber uh, is my favorite of these because Bluebeard, I think ostensibly it's, you know, it, 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 it's a tale about a woman uh, and, and, the, and the terrors that, that men inflict on women, but it also appealed, you know, to me as a child uh, when I read Bluebeard the first time. So essentially it is a really primal uh, type of horror story because it speaks to anyone who is powerless or has less power than than their provider. Uh, and number one, I went with The Lake by Tanana Reeve Du. Uh, you can find this in uh, Ghost Summer, a uh, collection that came out a few years ago and I reviewed it. I won't say a lot about this one, but essentially the setup is a teacher takes some summer classes down in Florida around... Uh, uh, the whole collection is, is, is centered around, or most of the collection is centered, centered in a certain area in, in Florida, Grace Lake, I believe it's called. And this story is a story of transformation. It's a story of feminine rage. It's a story of being an outsider, even if uh, you may have roots in an area. Uh, and I think that those all, there's a certain alchemy that, that do pulls off almost every story that she writes. She, she writes about tradition and yet, the the negative aspects that tradition is sort of a neutral term and you make of it what you will 
there are good traditions, there are bad traditions, and they have consequences. Uh, and the lake is one of her finest uh, and most overtly monster. She does a lot of ghost stories. This one sort of melds the ghost story, the monster story, the creature from the Black Lagoon uh, is, is peeping from behind the reeds in this one. And uh, that's my list. Yeah, she's an author I've definitely had on my radar that I've been wanting to read. I haven't yet. She's okay. exemplary. Yeah. Representing uh, while his Minnesota Vikings are either winning or losing. I don't know. But are not doing good, but it's all right. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mark Rothenberg, give us your honorable mentions. All right. First, the criteria. Uh, I There are some stories on here. I, I would say the majority of my stories all throughout are older stories. And one of my primary criteria, whether it's better, my favorite songs, my favorite books, my favorite movies, is the ability to just reread these over and over, re-see the movie, re-listen to the song, and never be bored by them. And, and one of the major criteria I have is, I mean, David, I don't know if he remembers this about me, but if I'm reading a book and at some point I get bored by it, I'll just put that book down. I want to be entertained, primarily. Yes, I want to think about it. And, and so you might not see a whole lot of social commentary in my favorites because it, I want to, again, be entertained. And there are, uh, again, favorite books of mine that have social commentary. But it, it's more about what grabs me. And, and to be honest with you, sadly, with the career I have as a judge, I've seen a lot of real horror in the world. Um, so I kind of harken back to when I was a kid and, and the kind of things that I did love. Like, you know, a lot of my introduction to short stories was Charles Beaumont, was, was uh, you know, stuff from The Twilight Zone, from, from Alfred Hitchcock Presents. And, and that kind of started me on, on this whole journey. So that being said, uh, like Laird, I, I kind of stayed away from putting a Laird Baron story on here, although I will say I'm a huge fan of Shiva, Shiva Open Your Eye. I, I think that's a fantastic story. And I know that... I remember reading a long time ago that that was what your first sale or right. something like that. But I, I love that. I mean, I'm a huge mythos sort of sort of guy. I love the cosmic core. That being said, I'll just jump right into it. You'll notice a lot of my picks have to do with two things, usually children or body horror. Those things just really kind of resonate with me. It's a little weird. All right, which starts with number five. I remember reading this when I was very young. It was a paperback <coughs> in, in my school library. Uh, and then I've discovered it's incredibly hard to find, which is a, a, a story called The Little Girl Eater uh, by a guy named Septimus Dale, who I know nothing about. I've tried to figure out who this guy is. I'm not it's sure probably that it's a not. pseudonym. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm thinking it is a pseudonym. And I actually have some suspicions because the story does have sort of a, a Raoul Dahl sort of ending to it. Um, this is... Uh, it's in a book called Pan's Fourth Book of Horror Stories, which is a British anthology. I try to reread all of these stories in the past several weeks. This one I could not find. This one I actually had to listen to a podcast where someone read it. Um, and it, it still stuck with me. It's a pretty easy setup. Uh, in the first moments of the story, you realize there's a man stuck under a pier uh, at a beach. And uh, this family is coming to the beach to visit. And it's sort of how he's found by a little girl and, and how that plays out. And again, it does have that Raul Dahl sort of punch at the end. I don't want to say anymore. It's really a short story. It's probably four pages long, but, but well worth it. Um, and while I said a lot of my stories are older. This oh, one's this one's not. modern. <laughs> yeah, this one's modern, which is The Third Bear by Jeff Vandermeer. I love Jeff's stuff. Uh, the Southern Reach trilogy, but even going back to Finch and, and some of his other stuff, uh, this book or this story about a small village who in a medieval village, it seems like who's terrorized by the third bear. And why is it the third bear? Well, because there were two other bears that terrorized them that season. Uh, and it might not be a bear. It might be something else. And this, this story actually edges into cosmic horror Um in an unexpected way. I didn't expect it to go there when I first read this. I think it's available on the internet. I think he might have even have it on his website. I'm not sure. Again, I just sort of love that. I love that setting. I love that the idea of a small village, a small community dealing with a problem that ends up being much bigger than 
what it seems to be, right? They all think it's a bear. They send a bunch of people out to kill the bear. And it doesn't go so well. Um, number three, Casting the Runes by uh, M.R. James. This is, I was introduced to this when I was a little kid. I, I saw the adaption, which is Night of the Demon. Um, still, in my opinion, it's a great story. It, it, you know, it's got that revenge concept to it, but it also has that supernatural. And, and I read this probably when I was maybe 12, and, and it just stuck with me. A lot of these stories are just, are just that. If you haven't read it, I'm sure you guys have read it, but all the people watching maybe haven't read it. Uh, definitely worth a read. Involves curses, witchcraft. Just, just good. Number two, um, The Events at Parth Farm by T.E.D. Klein. Uh, not we're, Ted Klein, T.E.D. Klein. We're going to talk more about him in the top 10 for sure. Okay, so. then I won't talk about him. But this is this is square in the mytho, the Cthulhu mythos, cosmic horror sort of way. So much so that uh, self-referential to the mythos. As a matter of fact, the 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 main character is a is a teacher who's gone out to stay at this farm to prepare for the upcoming term, and he's reading various books. And he talks about the King in Yellow. He even talks about supernatural horror and literature, the H.P. Lovecraft uh, essay, uh, and in typical mythos fashion, he kind of digs into something he's not supposed to and perhaps unleashes uh, horror upon the world. But it's but the way it's written, uh, being a new cat owner who's never owned cats before, uh, <laughs> it explains the behavior of cats to me uh, a little bit now. Now I understand. Um, I kind of wonder if there's cosmic horror in the cat that lives in my house. And my number one, uh, and it, it matches up with Mary's number one, which is The Lottery uh, by Shirley Jackson. I read this probably when I was in fifth grade after we watched the short movie of it. It's uh, rereading it, and I probably have only read it twice since then, right? But but rereading it, it's, it's easy that you're taught in school that it's about scapegoats and it's about this community and, and sort of violence. But rereading it, the line that sticks with me is lottery in June, corn heavy, corn be heavy soon. It almost deals with that, not cosmic horror, but, you know, this, the, the idea of the sacrifice, the idea of it's a little bit deeper than – it's hard to say it's a little deeper than other Shirley Jackson stuff because I think Shirley Jackson stuff is really deep in many ways. But, but to me, it, I reread it with a different eye to it in the past couple of weeks, and uh, – Again, it's just fantastic. Not to say, by the way, I've been—you see a pen in my hand. I've been taking notes of everyone's stories, and Mary, I might just be in love with you because those stories are all fantastic. Uh, they are Rose for Emily. Rose for Emily just missed my list. I love that story. The end story. where where you learn more about Emily. It's fantastic, fantastic story. Great story. Well, you guys have a mutual uh, listing, which means that we have the awkward thing of when we start number ten which is normally in the numbers, we're going to start with Mary. However, her number 10 is high on Mark's list. So okay. Mary, can you tell us what your number 10 is? And then we're going to go to Laird because we have to talk about that story later. Sure. My number 10 was I have no mouth and I must scream by Harlan Ellison. Right. So you and Mark are definitely on a similar page. Uh, Mark has that higher on his list. So we will come back to Harlan, <laughs> uh, but we have another science fiction writer representing with Laird with your number 10. Right. The science fiction writer being Barry Molesberg. Uh, and the story in question is called Transfer, which I don't know where it originally appeared. I know it's around 1957, 59, somewhere in there. You can find it though, probably have to use the Wayback Machine or something, but you, it was pub, uh, reprinted by Ellen Datlow Oh, it must be 15 years ago now or 16 years ago in sci-fiction. Um, it was one of her weekly, they would do an original and then do a weekly reprint. Malsberg also, uh, I didn't realize this, but one of my favorite films, one of my formative films, uh, influential on my writing was Phase 4. And uh, yeah, I have that. Actually, one of my uh, colleagues sent me, he goes, oh, I, I said, yeah, I've, I've never read it. I've just watched it. And he sent me that recently. But Malsberg knows horror. Uh, Malsberg, mm. I'll tell you what, there's some, there's something, cause I, I don't know how much I really want to go on and on about each story, but I just make general comments maybe that if it seems appropriate, uh, 
they're not to say that you know as we get as we get older the old the old stuff is the best stuff but i think there is a reason why there's so much uh what we would consider now if it were cars classical writing yep. uh or on our on our list is because i think the fundamentals of telling a story were very prized uh mm -hmm. and we've become less that's become less of a thing there's more of a, a diffusion of storytelling uh and places to tell stories and so it, the more the merrier and the more styles the merrier but i do think that for just if you if you start looking at stories that are almost like bedrock examples not the bedrock itself but just examples of that bedrock you're going to find a lot of older stories and and uh, uh even though we're talking about horror some of these are going to be uh from the pens of people who were who would never consider themselves horror writers a lot of them didn't even consider themselves genre writers specifically they considered themselves writers so barry malsberg could write a novelization with the same panache that he wrote this outrage short story in this case transfer which is one of the most i think a seminal especially because it's so it's so old at this point a seminal example of uh I don't know. A slasher fiction is the right word, but it touches on slasher. It touches on cosmic. the there's there's a cosmic angle. It uh, there's a block. There, there's basically the psycho. Uh, there's like you know kind of how uh, the the bifurcation of personality. There is the unreliable narrator. There's all these things, uh, and it leaves it up to the reader to decide. And, and a twist who, ending too. Well, yeah. or, or or is it? See, or that's is the it? Thing. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, that he uh, he plays with your mind in that story, and uh, just to set it up for everybody, basically it's set. I can't remember what city, but it's set in a big city, New York, and an office, an office, uh, kind of a mid level to higher level office guy is kind of ruminating on the fact there's all these murders taking place. Women are being are being murdered, and he goes for a walk at night, and things happen. And I'm I'm going to kind of leave it there. Uh, it's it's more important just to know that this is. This is like one an older version of form, you know. Obviously, you go back to Poe, you know, if we want to start talking about the grandfathers, the OGs. But this story is, you know, 50, uh, 60 years, almost 60 years old. And it's, um, uh, like I said, a seminal example of, of its kind. And it has an ending that uh, is one of the, the, the most brutal and, and resonant endings I've ever read in the story. Yeah, it's, it, it's a phenomenal short story. And um, I'm going to put a little plug out there that we interviewed Barry Maltzberg on the Dickheads podcast. And um, he also, if you want to read his science fiction novels, have a real horrific angle at some points too. And I would definitely recommend Beyond Apollo. Before uh, you, oh, I, and I, I, I neglect like to say just one thing. Yeah. I met him uh, a couple of years after I read it, probably three years after I read it, because I read it, like I said, 2004, something like that. I happened to be at ReaderCon uh probably two years later and i walked i saw him it was late at night and he was just heading for his room by himself i'd never met him but i recognized him i walked over and i told him i shook his hand and you know and he's you you've talked to him he's a very stern he can be he's a very serious man he <laughs> very was visibly, crotchety yeah. well i'm not gonna i serve it yeah no he's he suffers no fools and right. i walked up and said mr mallsberg i just want to tell you he was it, i'm so glad i did Everybody out there, if you if you love a writer's work, walk up to him, you know, pin him against the wall, whatever you got to do, tell him, tell him, because this guy doesn't need my, uh, you know, my praise. Uh, but he he it moved him that somebody had read that story, that story that's as old as you know, it was fifty something years old, it was fifty years old at the time, and uh, that really moved me in return. Yeah, yeah, it's a great story, and uh, highly recommended it to track it down. Uh, but all Maltzberg is, it is he's just a really interesting science uh, short story writer. He also has a really great short story called Idea that was written under a pen name. He also wrote Erotica. <coughs> on, um, that he Probably the most books he sold were these like weird 70s erotica novels. But that's all, all the great ones did. Yeah. <laughs> um, Got paid the bills. Paging Jose Farmer. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Mark, you're number 10. You know, I said all my stories were older for the most part, except they're really not, I guess. Uh, this number 10 <laughs> made my list because, you know, I read the story with a smile on my face all the way through, all the way through. And that is Skull Pocket by Nathan Ballingard. Um, 
I thought, you know, the, the first line in that story <coughs> woke me up, which is, you know, jo and I wrote it down, Jonathan Wormcake, the gentleman corpse of Hobbs Landing, greets me at the door himself. And that in and of itself told me that I was, I was walking into a, a world that I just didn't know. And, and, um, and, and what he does, and I, and I want to say it's probably 20, maybe 30 pages. What he does in those 20 or 30 pages is something pretty remarkable. He builds, he world builds in such a way when I was done with that story, I really felt like I knew what was, what this whole, it was a very strange landscape that I was in. And it involves uh, something called the Skull Pocket Fair. It's all about a ghoul. Uh, and you know this in probably the first paragraph of the, of the book. And I, I wasn't sure if they meant a real ghoul, but it ends up being a real ghoul. Uh, and, and he invited 14 kids to his house to uh, tell us a particular story. And, and while they're going through that story, it talks about his history and sort of the history of ghouls and, and, and sort of this transformation they made from being underground, or at least he did, to living above ground in this community and how the community has sort of changed in the 70 plus years. Uh, that this fair has been been held, and you know, when you got characters that you know is a brain in a jar and an orchid girl, and <laughs> and again, it's something that at the very end it stuck with me because it, it made me smile. I thought it was just a, a fun story. There were definitely some somber moments in it, uh, but in the end, it, I just felt like it was complete. And some stories kind of leave it where there are other things to think about. This one didn't. It was. It was like a satisfying sandwich. I was done at the end of eating the sandwich and, you know, but I could go back and eat another sandwich of the same kind, uh, <laughs> if that makes any sense at all. I just thought it was really well written and it, I thought it was just kind of charming and it reminded me a bit of some Neil Gaiman stuff. Um, but I would love to see this adapted into sort of like Coraline was in, in sort of a uh, claymation sort of stop motion thing. I think it would be awesome. But that was, that was my number 10 before I got into the darker stuff, which is nine through one. <laughs> <laughs> well, my number 10 uh, is another science fiction writer, uh, old school sci-fi writer. Uh, nobody gives a literary middle finger better than Norman Spinrad. And uh, so I picked Street Meat by Norman Spinrad, which was in his collection, Other Americas, which is all novellas except for this one short story, which, um, you know, leave it to a guy who would write a novel as Hitler to spoof the Lord of the Rings, right? In the iron dream to write a story like street meat that was written in the eighties about um, people kibble being a product where the homeless are harvested for food. Um, and street meat is just one of those stories that as I read it, I just couldn't believe it existed. <laughs> like that, Someone published this that Norman Spinrad was going there. And it was early in my time of reading Spinrad. Like now I know that going there is like what Norman Spinrad does. And, um, you know, um, I did interview him for Dickheads and he was so angry the first five minutes. It's one of the most hilarious interviews I've ever done um, because he hated the technology. But that's all I'll say about that. Uh, Street Meat by Norman Spinrad. And number nine, Mary. Number nine, my number nine choice was The Great God Pan by Ar Arthur Machen. Um, I liked this story because uh, it was, well, frankly, it was one of the first cosmic horror stories I read outside of Lovecraft. But what I always thought that, um, that he did with The Great God Pan and with other other works of his, uh, you know, other contemporaries of his too did this, was that it was the first time it occurred to me that he could use, uh, that, that really cosmic horror entities were, were used as a kind of metaphor for forces of nature that we can't control and that they're kind of terrifying in and of themselves. But the great God Pan has a lot. I mean, it has a lot going on. It has a, it, it basically, if, you, if you've never read the story, it's, it's told from a couple of different people's points of view. And much like, you know, much like a lot of Lovecraft's work, 
it's only when you put all the pieces together that you start to see this full picture of an evil that people unwittingly unleashed on the world. And that, that evil is really only a, a precursor, a, a kind of John the Baptist, you know, making the way for something bigger and something more horrible. Uh, and I, I, one of the things I liked about, one of the things that I find like truly horrific about the story, despite the monsters, and, and I guess this maybe comes up a couple of times in my list, is that there's a casual cruelty and indifference to life in this story that is maybe more disturbing than the, the monster, than the antagonistic force itself. Uh, the, the, the way that they can so casually cause this, th this event to happen in the first place and that subsequently that people can so easily succumb to forces that they know are going to destroy them from the inside out and are still okay with that somehow until it, until it happens. Um, I, I found it to be a very powerful kind of story in that way. You know, I love monstery goodness in and of itself, but uh, I think that's what stuck with me most about this particular story. Mm. Okay, Laird, you're number eight. Uh, number eight or my number? Oh, no, number, no, nine, sorry. Right, okay. Um, well, Oops. I decided that I needed to wrap uh, graphic novels uh, in this list. Uh, uh, Junji Ito, big in Japan, less so over here. I, I think that he, well, actually he's had a lot more commercial success. I would, I would venture just because of the movies and stuff, but I, I think he's sort of Japan's Ligotti uh, probably gets a lot of, they, I wouldn't, I would imagine that, that he's gotten some nutritional value from Ligotti, but uh, the Enigma of Amagara <laughs> fault uh, is, is the one I'm listing at nine. Uh, it was initially published by big comic spirits I, I'm, I'm not sure what it comes out in the U.S., but Viz Media, you can find it online. It's a fairly short story. Uh, the setup is um, there's been an earthquake, uh, like in central Japan, exposing the fault line. And people start flocking to it just out of curiosity, but also because uh, there are all these silhouettes, uh, these holes going into the into the earth that have been revealed. And they're like perfectly almost machine made they're not chipped or naturally occurring i mean they must be naturally occurring but they certainly don't look like it and they're just sort of like these generic cutouts of people and you know uh sort of like it's you know sort of like the arms you know extended the legs extended like this um you know spread eagle essentially and they're at all heights uh you know th this fault is I, just look at the comic you know it could be 60 70 feet tall in places the cliff sides and Okay, that's pretty creepy, pretty weird. They're they're trying to to run fiber optic cables down them and see what there is to see, but uh, the the action really gets going when a character goes, "That hole is mine. It was made for me," and the guy climbs up there, goes spread eagle, and he starts inching his way into the into the hole, and it becomes this uh, mental illness that sweeps through sweeps through people visitors people are see it on tv and they they'll still see their hole you know and, and to the viewer all the whole all the silhouettes look identical but not to the the individual and i won't i won't go any farther there's just you know just creepy development after creepy development but it's it's essentially a very simple idea uh i selected it because i think uh, a lot of good work is done in the visual media uh it, obviously writing's visual but i mean the sense of uh, graphic novels and you know manga things like that uh that I, I think there's a lot of good stuff out there Edo alone i mean just uh, so much good stuff i could have picked any number of stories uh like other authors on my personal list it wasn't necessarily what i consider my favorite or even their best but one that i think if, if you haven't read th these authors or you haven't encountered their stories th this would be a really great entry point uh it touches on the cosmic and one of the secrets of cosmic horror isn't just the uh, minuteness of man or the idea that, you know, this has been going on forever and will always be going on, but it's, but it's, but it's also inevitability. 
-hmm. there's this inevitability to cosmic horror and to probably the best horror in general, but the cosmic horror specifically, that the idea that once this secret's revealed, mm -hmm. the once the shock of it's revealed, the inevitability of it overtakes you. Mm -hmm. I, I can second the Edo thing. I had uh, my favorite Edo is The Long Dream, which is, you know, the concept of time stretching through the dreams. Oh, it's fantastic. fantastic yeah, stuff. he does. He does horror. I mean, I'm, glad, I'm so glad to hear you say that because, you know, he does this extreme horror, cosmic horror, uh, supernatural horror. He also does man you know the the evil of, of that man does to man and even sort of like indifferent the indifferentness of of the wilderness or of even the urban wilderness it's the got the, the man has range hmm. all right uh uh mr rothenberg your number eight you know this author has a lot of great books but i still consider him his best work to be you know short stories which is stephen He's, king and, and this is this he might be going actually, places <laughs> yeah, he might. That guy might know what he's doing as far as short stories. And this goes back to what Laird just said about the inevitability, the horror there, and that is the road virus heads north. Mm -hmm. um, this is in uh, published what, 19, 2000, somewhere around there, I think. Uh, I think it's in Everything's Eventual, um, and this is about a writer who's driving from um, Boston back to Maine, back to Derry, Maine, and he stops at a like a roadside yard sale and he finds this picture, which is super creepy. And he kind of, if I remember correctly, he kind of buys it almost as a lark. Cause it's got this guy with fangs who's driving over a bridge in Boston and, and it's titled the road virus heads North. And he starts uh, and he buys it just cause why not? And, and it turns out that there's a lot more to this painting. And, and I think me telling you more than that would kind of spoil it, but it definitely deals with, the realization of inevitability and and the horror that that comes into that right where there's just something that can't some things that just can't be stopped and even if you wanted to stop them uh tough that's just, it just again that's the cosmic part of it there's just uh, this plan in place and it's it's not going to stop turns out and they tell you this early in the story it's not a spoiler that the guy who had painted the picture went mad killed himself burnt all of his other paintings. This is the only one that survived. In, in a lot of ways, and it's not just a picture, it reminded me of a little bit of H.P. Lovecraft's Pickman's model in, in what the the art does to someone. People literally say that, you know, they die, I died for my art. Well, what if you just went mad from your art? And that's kind of, that's part of this too. But, but the inevitability, I think, is what really brings this horror. And I think, I think Stephen King really does a fantastic job with that, almost 99% uh, of his short stories. But this one, again, it just, you just feel it building and you, and you almost know what's going to happen at the end, but it, it but you keep going. You, 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 the horror is there and you really just want to see it through. And, and you do in the end of this, but, uh, and I think it's been adapted uh, maybe once or twice. I think it was at least on, didn't Mick Garris have, uh, he had a Nightmares and Dreamscapes. 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 Yeah, I think it was adapted on there at one yep. point, which I didn't like the adaption that much, but uh, but I absolutely love the story. All right, well, breaking Laird's rule, I have next story is from a friend. Um, and this is one that I saw this author read it before it was published. And so I admit that that has a lot to do color my love for this story but it was published in cemetery dance so uh and that is wasted on the young by cody goodfellow and the story is in strategies against nature his collection and wasted on the young is a punk rock horror story about um meth heads and weirdo homeless punk rockers and it takes place here in san diego and there's like this super underground club where they have the nastiest, gnarliest punk shows, and you have to be abducted by this secret bus to take you to the shows. <laughs> and so this bus runs around the city abducting homeless punk kids and dropping them off at this insane show. And so the idea of this bus just cruising around San Diego abducting homeless people, which we have plenty of um, because of the weather, 
uh, was is just a, a really frightening concept. And um, Cody, uh, I think, is one of the best writers of my generation. Um, I hate to pump up his ego that much uh, um, as my friend, uh, but uh, he is a great writer. Um, he does body horror really well. So I almost said at water, which I know Ellen Datlow just recollected. Um, but wasted on the young is the story that I first saw Cody read. Um, and he's a great reader, much like Harlan Ellison. And, um, and so I have a lot of love for this story. And when it appeared in cemetery dance, I already knew the story, but I reread it and was just like, hell yeah. I was really excited to see that story get wider play i love wasted on the young by cody goodfellow so mary your number eight okay my number eight and i you know like like we had we've talked about earlier it, it surprised me a little bit that because this is a ramsey campbell story and uh ramsey campbell is kind of one of my literary idols uh, that he's at a number number eight but um i think that there's just there's so so much so many stories that it's hard like a lot of these stories i think i could have put at sort of equal footing but uh i i chose the man in the underpass now of all the stories this one this one was at least when i first read it i read it in uh, alone with the horrors and i of all the stories in that collection that one got me the most and i i think it's because it's a combination of both stories that involve children in peril or children causing peril. Um, and sometimes there's, there's sort of a subtle difference between the two, uh, an uncomfortably subtle difference between the two. And also, again, that sort of cruelty, that casual cruelty that is sometimes more inherent in children than in adults. And I, I think that this story, uh, you know, in addition to having a sort of, cosmic horror raising an ancient god kind of aspect to it um it it got me because when you know when you're a little girl particularly and i'm sure little boys are told this too but little girls especially are told that uh you know you have to you can't talk to strangers and you have to you know be careful that you don't go off with anybody and that grown men to little girls are sometimes a sort of intimidating and possibly you know, dangerous entity to, 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 to a little girl. So uh, for, for, for more than, you know, just, you know, physically violent reasons, but then there's that, because there's that almost that added sexual component kind of thing to it. And Ramsey Ca Campbell captures the subtlety of that horror, that boogeyman horror, particularly, I think, for little girls in this particular story. And he does it just so well. I mean, he could write about toilet paper and make it sound scary because of the the the, the mastery of uh, this this growing dread that he puts in his own work. But but this one in particular, I think it got me because it dealt with a couple of different uh, a couple of different aspects of horror, but primarily the way that the supernatural can casually and negatively affect even little even children. So that was mine. The Man in the Underpass, Ramsey Campbell. Yeah, I'm more of a Ramsey Campbell novel fan. I like his short stories, but uh, was it the face that would, must die? Or I'm, say, I'm sorry if I'm saying the title wrong. That was is what is a great novel, um, and I think um, Ramsey Campbell writes serial killers like incredibly well. Uh, he's underrated for that. So yeah, good good pick, um, Laird. Your number eight. Uh, <clears throat> Michael Shea, uh, the late, great Michael Shea. Uh, I could have picked any number of stories uh, by him. This is not even, this used to be my favorite. It's not even my favorite, but I think it's extremely representative of him at the height of his power. Uh, it's a novella. I shamelessly include a couple of novellas on this list. But they're, <laughs> they're, they're not novels, they're stories then. Um, Agreed. <laughs> so uh, uh, the autopsy. And this appeared in Polyphemus, his great seminal collection, which you probably, if, unless you have a few hundred bucks in your pocket, you might not be able to find it. Uh, but he's had some, some stuff recently uh, released. I think Demiurge might collect it. Uh, also, I read it the first time 
in Hartwell's Dark Descent. As I have, as I have actually, I want to say maybe three or four of the stories on my list. And that doesn't bother me at all because, of course, the, the Dark Descent is a legendary anthology for a reason. Uh, Hartwell outdid himself. And I remember what he said about Michael Shea that really made me look into Michael Shea. He goes, one of the most criminally under, I'm just paraphrasing, but essentially he, he said, this man's criminally under, under read. Uh, this is one of the best writers. And I had never heard of him when I read it, uh, or, or maybe vaguely. And so uh, it's one of, the, one of the reasons I included it is, well, there's a couple. One, how can I not? There's so many other authors that, like I know Harlan Ellison, no Peter Straub, no Jeff Ford, but I'm going to put Michael Shea on there. And Michael Shea, uh, the, one of the reasons I selected this particular story is because it's a quasi mythos story. I remember talking to him about it. I'm not, I cannot remember if he denied or, or just <laughs> smiled when he said it was sort of, mythos oriented i know that they've incorporated it. chaosium has, u- has used it the traveler uh the creature in this story but another uh reason that i picked it is because yes it's a cosmic horror story it's overtly a cosmic horror story it is uh there's a there's a ufo component and it's also a borderline peripherally a locked room story uh Mm. Amagara Fault, the Enigma Amagara Fault also takes place in, in a location, but this thing takes place almost entirely in an old, like an old freezer room that he's, that the, that the action takes place in. And you say to yourself, how can this guy do a, I want to say a 25,000 word story, something like that with, you know, 18,000, 20,000 words of it in this room? Well, you will see my friend, but the quick setup, it's about a doctor who's, oh, my dog is visiting me. Um <laughs> She's, she's like, what are you doing in there? Uh, <laughs> anyway, he, he, uh, he's dying of cancer. And he, he is summoned to this small, small Pacific Northwest town, or Northern California, I can't remember which, but right in that area, there has been uh, a mine explosion. And he has been summoned to do the autopsy. But the sheriff, who's drinking and acting very peculiar, their old friends, says there's more to it than that. And he is, he spends the evening, the bulk of the story alone. He's left alone. If you need anything, just there's a rotary phone in the other room, you know, I'll be, you know, if you need help with help, you know, we need help now. I'm, I'll be minutes away. Uh, and, and he's in the, he's in this, he's in this room with, I think seven or eight shrouded corpses. And n- needless to say, he begins to discover irregularities in their, in, in their uh, physiognomies. So I'll leave, I'll leave it at that. It's, it's one of the, best exercises of escalating dread that has a payoff horror sometimes flubs the payoff the payoff is as good as anything uh and i'll leave it there all right so mark you and i both have uh, big time classic authors next mark go yeah Yeah, you know it's hilarious because i swear i've never met laird uh although i'm honored to be with him now but he writes the best transitions for my (laughs) <laughs> statement here which is the payoff you're well payoff is the key absolutely thank you <laughs> and so my number eight has in my opinion one of the <laughs> best payoffs in horror history uh which is rats in the wild by hp lovecraft um uh, anyone you know we could argue about hp lovecraft and uh, dude he was not a good guy i get that and you could say sign of the times whatever but but you can't deny his contributions is, as far as what his writing was. And Rats in the Walls brings in this just creepy feeling with this guy, you know, Delaport, coming back to his ancestral home and, and you know, his son dying and he's going to try to, you know, work on this house. And he discovers something under his house that leads to terrible family secrets. And, and in the end, it, it's sort of this... Yeah, there's some cosmic horror in there, but it, it really is this man versus man conflict and the horrors that he discovers about his ancestors and his family secrets that essentially just drives him insane. Um, and the payoff, the sort of last lines of the book and, and the position it puts the narrator in, Delapore, uh, I think it really just hammers home, uh, you know, what happens uh, when you discover something that is just so terrible 
you can't deal with it. Plus, it's got one of the coolest names of any estate ever, which is Exum Priory. I just, for some reason, I just love that. Um, but there you go. That's, you know, if you haven't read it, read it. I'm just, I know, I guarantee you all, everyone on this podcast has read it. Uh, I just, for some reason, I just love it. It's just, I could have picked any number of Lovecraft stories, but this one, again, just always just gets to me. I just love it. Well, of course, we have uh, one of you has uh, Lovecraft at number one. So we will return to, to Howie uh, in a little bit. Um, my number eight um, uh, is an author who is known by the pen name James Tiptree Jr. Mm-hmm. But uh, of course, was uh, her real name was Alice Sheldon. And um, my number eight is The Screw Fly, Screw Fly Solution by... Uh, James Tiptree Jr., a.k.a. Alice Sheldon. This is, to me, it is um, whether you're talking my personal favorites or best, this is a top 10 horror story of all time. Um, we're currently seeing it be sort of ripped off on TV right now with Why the Last Man. Um, this is one of the original, like, ha- um, you know, gender, half the gender drops off the planet stories with, um, <coughs> and, uh, but the and even though the twist ending is in the title, <laughs> the twist ending is in the title. It still works. <laughs> um, there are incredibly creepy moments in this story. Well, Alice Sheldon was known for being a science fiction writer. Um, several of her stories are absolutely 100% horror, and this is one of them. This is an absolutely freaky story. I just reread it this year. It absolutely works just as well as it used to. I know it's been adapted a few times. Um, I have been afraid to watch those adaptations because I love it the way it is. And, um, but yeah, um, Laird, I would like to get your thoughts a little bit on, on Alice Sheldon, because I know you're a big fan too. Um, Just, you know, what makes Alice Sheldon's writing work so well? Her fucking ruthlessness. (laughs) <laughs> I, one of the be- one of the yeah. worst myths. One of the worst myths. Yeah, I'm a fan of genre uh, in the sense of as a, as a category because I think it it can be. It, there's a dark side. There's a there's a bad edge to it, which is people get get shoehorned into you know mm-hmm. boxes. But the good side is that we have a shorthand to discuss things, and then we can deviate from that shorthand. It mm-hmm. makes a list like like ours possible, where you can say, look, I think Paul Bowles, who appears twice on my list. You're not a horror author, and maybe that's not a horror story. But since we all have the shorthand for what we kind of go, yeah, this is sort of centerline horror. Mm-hmm. You can, it gives you the room to do that. And Alice Sheldon, I, it's funny that you 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 call on me because I'm, I I really wrestled with including uh, one of my favorite stories of all time. And, and if I put it on the list, it would have been in my top ten. Was uh, uh, love is the plan? The plan is death. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I just really wrestled with. Mm, there's just so many other other worthy authors, but she is ruthless. And the, and the myth that women uh, do not appreciate violence, that women do not appreciate, uh, you know, hard boiled or nourish elements or just fucking ruthless elements is one of the biggest canards I have ever I have made my career going. Of course, there are people who don't like my stuff, but it's divided between men and women who don't. Oh, that's, oh, that's gross. That's drug use in it, et cetera women are not only do they love that stuff the uh, some of the best uh crime mystery noir and horror have been perpetrated <laughs> by women well and she I was think, a freaking spy she was a spy <laughs> right <laughs> you and know so for me that's what i like about her writing it's another reason i love shirley jackson and angela carter they're like the, the trinity of these o'connor uh, mm-hmm. These are hard edged people and they all have their different approaches. They take their different approaches, but Sheldon's one of the greats. Yeah. Um, yeah. The screw fries. Raccoon, Raccoon, Sheldon. Yes. Yes. I think she wrote that. I, the story that I'm talking about, uh, the love yeah. is the plan. Plays. If she wrote that, I think it was Raccoon, Sheldon. She wrote that under, I can't remember. Yeah. But, she yeah. had many, many, many pseudonyms. So it's hard to kind of unpack. We could do that. a, we could, we could do a panel on her. She, it would be well worth it. Yeah, yeah. Um, noted. Um, and <laughs> we'll come back to that at some point. Um, number seven, Mary. Okay, my number seven Yes. was 
Casting the Runes by M.R. James. I know Mark had talked about it a little bit. Uh, this was, and, and, I, and I, you know, this point up <coughs> a whole lot, you know, that I'll add other than that uh, this story to me manages to both be funny and disturbing, like genuinely disturbing. Uh, because again, it goes back to that idea of superstition, which to me, uh, you know, if, if you are inclined in any way to believe in anything, I think that you can't discount the power of superstition on the human psyche. And this is one of those stories that I, I really believe uh, captures that. Uh, there's, there's some humor in it because I think M.R. James had a, 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 an almost winking approach to writing anyway, but not at the expense of, you know, what was truly disturbing in his work. And, and, I, and I like that. I'm not one of those people, I don't think, that can write stuff that's both funny and scary. Uh, so I admire that. And, and uh, pretty much anything of M.R. James I've ever read has uh, a, a little bit of that. In, and in, but it, it never, it, it, the humor's never at the, you know, sacrificing the scary part of it. So. Oh, well said. Thank you. That's a roll doll. I put him in a roll doll. I mean, that mm -hmm. I think you, got, you cut right to the essence of James. He, he, I believe a lot of those stories are like Christmas stories, you know, and it's like, right. sure, he lulls you in, just like roll doll. Oh, yeah, it's <laughs> gentle. And then the knife. So, yes. Right. Well, right. Well, well done. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. Uh, Laird, you get to tell us what your number seven is, but we're going to have to come back to it because somebody has it a little higher than you. Number seven, Sticks by Carl Edward Wagner. Yes, um, I guess I, I, I know you could never guess who has that on their list. Uh, <laughs> All the glee. <laughs> uh, yes, we will come back to sticks, um, which is one I considered as well, but it didn't quite make mine. So I'm glad you guys had it. Um, so, Mark, you're number seven. I swear the Laird, the Laird leading me into the next thing is just <laughs> awesome. Um, it's The Landlady by Raul Dahl. Uh, oh yes, that's one of the best. It's 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 the best, and I was and I read this in Kiss Kiss so long ago, and it's hilarious because my daughter, a couple years ago in high school, was it took a a genre fiction class, and I'm so happy she did because they had her read this, and we discussed it afterwards, and it was just spectacular to, to talk to someone with new eyes on this story. Were you right? insufferable because to that teacher? Was, I bet you were insufferable <laughs> to that teacher. I, I, I stayed away. I was not. I was never a helicopter okay. parent. My kid, you know, we could talk about. You know, David knows that I every year I put on a whole horror festival for my kid uh, called Screen Break, where we just watch genre movies for a whole week. She watched like nice. twenty five. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Nice. Going back, it's my kid. My kid is fully versed in horror, and she's just not that person at all. But anyway, let's go back to the landlady, which is. A very innocent story, much like Roll Doll tends to do, right? And I could have picked several Roll Doll stories, uh, Lamb to the Slaughter, stuff like that. But the landlady just gets to me because it's about a guy who's who's going to start a new job in Bath, in, in the city of Bath, and he finds a boarding house after being turned away from an inn. And, and the landlady there, she's super, super nice, but there's, there's something sinister there just based on little comments she makes about old boarders who've been there. Right. You know, there was, I remember him, there wasn't a blemish on his body. And the guy's like, what? And she's like, Oh, never mind. I don't know what I'm talking about. Just, I'm an old lady. Don't worry about me. Uh, and then again, it's the raw dog gut punch. It's that knife in the gut that you get at the very end of that story. And, and she acts almost very motherly. Um, he was so good at writing. That's why when I talked about, you know, that whole Septimus Dale story where I don't can't find anything about, I kind of tend to think that Raldal might be that guy because it was a very Raldal thing, just sort of this innocent, innocent, innocent boom. And, and the landlady's been adapted many times into many things, including I think on the Tales of the Unexpected. Mm -hmm. It might even that was a pretty creepy adaptation now that I think about it. Uh definitely worth a read not a super long read but man again one that just stuck with me what good choice i love that story 
All right. Um, number seven is one that I uh, told Laird to read on Twitter a couple months ago. I don't know uh, if he did or not, but um, I bet I didn't. <laughs> probably not. But I remember I did. Um, <laughs> this is um, and I want to say before I launch into this, that this story was a seminal story for one of my favorite writers, F. Paul Wilson. And he was the one that that pointed me in the direction of this story when I interviewed him for a panel on dickheads about Anthony Boucher. Anthony Boucher is one of the foundational authors of the mystery genre, but also also the science fiction genre. We wouldn't have Philip K. Dick if as a writer, if um, Anthony Boucher wasn't one of his regular customers at the record store he worked in in Berkeley and encouraged him to come to his writer's group. He first published Richard Matheson. Charles Beaumont. Uh, many of these authors got their start in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, which Anthony Boucher was a co-founder of. And I just want to put that out there because his bona fides are so important as an editor, um, more so than as a writer, but he was a fantastic writer. And he has this collection, The Complete Werewolf. And all these stories um, come from his production of science fiction fantasy and horror during world war ii this is stories that he wrote in the early 40s and there's a story in there called they bite and they bite is like a combination of the doctor who episode blink and the hills have eyes but it was written in the 40s so you have these creatures that can only move when you're talking about them so they oh. yeah so like you like when there's when the legendary tales of them are being told they move closer to you and they exist in this desert town in california but they always stay out of sight but they eat people so there's it, it, it's it is one of the best horror stories i only read it a couple months ago but um f paul wilson when we did our panel on tony boucher he kept saying they bite by tony boucher like rocked his world when he was a kid and it was one of the stories that got him to be a horror writer and f paul wilson is one of my absolute favorite writers so as soon as he said that i jumped right ahead in this book to read they bite first and then read the whole collection the whole collection is great there's a lot of humor in it the, the, the title story the complete werewolf is hilarious um and then there's some great uh, science fiction stories with tubes to the airport and all kinds of awesome 40s stuff so Nice. Uh, they, they bite by Anthony Boucher. I highly, highly recommend that one. Um, and that's the most recent, the, it's the one that I read the most recently for the first time. So, uh, Mary, your number six. My number six was The Mask of the Red Death by Edgar Allan Poe. And the reason I chose this one, I mean, I, I, I debated a little bit about putting Poe on here only because I feel like it should just go without saying that any top 10 list of short stories would include a post story somewhere. And there are so many to pick from, but this one was always my favorite one. And when I really thought about why it was my favorite, I think it, it came down to, uh, it came down to a couple of things. One, again, it has that for, I, and I almost only ever write supernatural horror. Uh, it's just a personal preference, uh, and but yet I noticed that in all the supernatural horror stories that I really admire and I try to do this a little bit in my own stuff it's it's that idea again of this sort of casual cruelty of human beings either as a result of the supernatural uh horror or as a catalyst for it and I there there's definitely that in this I it's I think because of the time it was written it's maybe not as gratuitous as a modern writer might approach this. I mean, I've, I've talked to, to like when I've, when I've taught this short story in uh, literature classes, I've told them that the different colored rooms all mean something and they're all up to some, some pretty crazy shenanigans in each room. And you can almost guess based on the color and possibly, you know, some of the descriptions, what they're doing in that room. And it's, it's, it's an entire, uh, castellated abbey of vices and, and that are being done while the people that they're responsible for are dying 
And th that in and of itself is horrible, but it also comes back to, um, I, I, think it, I think it was Laird that was talking about the inevitability of horror, uh, that this was an inevitability that they, they just couldn't foresee, even though they should have been able to. And, and, and frankly, I, I, the, the, the last thing is, is that death has got some style here. Like if you're going to roll up as, as a, a, you know, as, as death itself, I mean, if you are going to personify yourself to a bunch of human beings that, you know, have it coming, this is a really cool way to do it. <laughs> you know, he is just so, or it, I guess should say it, it is so badass <laughs> in this story that, you can't help not rooting for the red death to win because it's, he's just that cool. All right. Uh, Laird. Well, Number six. All right. I, I applaud that pick. Um, Christopher Lee's reading of it, which is available somewhere online because everything seems to be is not to be slept on. Nice. Uh, it's just fab. I mean, it's a fabulous story, but hearing, Christopher Lee read it is just amazing. Uh, I, I had Gabriel. I, I I heard it with Gabriel Byrne reading it, which is oh, I bet. very good too. Yeah, I, I imagine. I imagine. Um, one of my favorite actors. Number six, uh, a classic, kind of a modern classic, uh, "The Summer People" by Shirley Jackson. Oh, nice. Uh, I encountered it in "The Dark Descent," uh, Hartwell's anthology. Uh, it is, I selected it because, um, you know, one of the things I went for on my list, I, I tried to go up for a little bit of diversity, uh, you know, uh, different perspectives, but also sort of just to show the spectrum and not just focus on my personal favorite, which is obviously cosmic horror, but, uh, or noir, or noir stylings. But the summer people is one of the most elegant, understated and gentle. It's not even you know, like rolled doll kind of tongue in cheek. No, no, no. It's very gentle. It's, it's, uh, you know, this, this examination of an, uh, of an older retired couple who go to this, they've been doing it for years. They go to this, uh, little cottage cabin, you know, in the Hills and they've been doing it for a while. And this time they decide to stay longer. They decide, you know, instead of leaving, uh, you know, with fall, they're going to maybe stay a little while. And that really confuses the, the locals. The locals are like, but nobody ever, ever stays. Uh, it is a non-supernatural horror story. Uh, I think it's adjacent to the lottery. It's certainly adjacent to the oblique or elliptical styling of, of, of Aikman, where mm -hmm. the true horror uh, is the implication, the mm -hmm. true sinister uh, sort of tightening of the of, of the spring is in what's not said mm -hmm. or what is said obliquely I, I i remember when i read it the first time i i had to read it multiple times to to understand why it ended the way that it did uh and it's also one of those stories uh where you you, you the, that it continues uh, after the the ending of the story so um i would say a, a modern if not a contemporary classic a modern classic of the understated, elegant, very quiet uh, horror, but yet, in its implication, as horrific as anything you know that I've listed so far. All right, Mark, and um, and don't worry, folks. Uh, re being recorded, we're going to take a break in a little bit. Um, <laughs> uh, Mark, you're number six. Yeah, I, I just have to make comment about Shirley Jackson. I think Laird's absolutely right. I mean, he, uh, she is. She was a master of the understated horror. I remember reading, you know, and we're talking about short stories, but we've always lived in the castle in mm -hmm. that the understated just dread and horror that's in that book. And, and again, it permeates through everything I've ever read by her. Uh, I mean, Haunting at Hill House. It's just mm -hmm. she's amazing. Amazing. Uh, that being said, you didn't transition to this one for me, so you lose now. Um, all right, number six. <laughs> a very short, <laughs> well, that's the way it is, man. No uh, I'll be pretty blunt about it. Number six for me, I first heard this when I was probably four or five years old on a record album. It was a, uh, it was Alfred Hitchcock's Ghost Stories for Young People. So I love this so much that I found this album. I bought this album. I put it digital. And every year, 
every October, I play this album over and over in my car for my daughter, for myself. And this is an adaption. Uh, that was an adaption of this story, which I, I've grown to really love, which is The Open Window by Sakai, which was uh, uh, a British author, H.R. H. H. Monroe. I don't know if you guys have read it. It's a very short story. This is one of those children are evil stories. Um, and, and what I love about the story without going too much, I'll go into it a little bit. It's about this guy who's got a nervous condition and his doctor has prescribed that he gets out a little bit more and, you know, and deals with his anxiety by getting out and meeting people. So he talks to his sister and his sister gives him some letters of introduction for him to go and meet um, some friends she had known. And he arrives at this house and this was published in 1911. But in its public domain, you can go find this on the internet. And he, he when he gets there, he meets this little girl. And, and I'm not going to spoil it because I'm not going to tell you the end, but I, I do have to tell you the setup. And the little girl is like, hey, who are you? And he explains who he is and he explains why he's there. And, and the little girl says stuff like, so you don't know anyone here? And, no, I don't. And, and you're here to just see my aunt? Yes. Uh, and then the little girl, he notices there's an open window, an open door. And it's kind of breezy outside. She goes, you're looking at the open door, right? She goes, yeah. And he goes, she goes, yeah, I'm so sorry. You know, it's, it's just the anniversary. And he's like, well, what anniversary? Well, my, my brother and my uncle, they all went out hunting. And uh, yes. a couple of years ago, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and they're going to come back. And my aunt sadly thinks they're going to come back. And mm -hmm. she keeps the door open every day. And, and terror just ensues from there. But it's a fantastic story. What I loved about this story is, you know, it's easy to say a person in a story is a liar. It's, but more than in this story, the, the, one of the characters is an unreliable narrator to another character in the story, mm -hmm. which, which you don't see very much, but man, I love, I love the story. I am in love with this story. It's, it's spectacular. And as a matter of fact, I'll probably end up listening to it while I drive <laughs> around today at some point. Uh, but the open window by Sakai, uh, just a great story. I think it has been adapted into other things, probably in Alfred Hitchcock presents. I just have never really watched it. I just love the telling of the story the way I heard it. And again, just reading it. Uh, okay. That's awesome. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. So medical from, advice is a leading cause of death in horror stories. <laughs> <laughs> it, oh, and it totally is in this story. Uh, well, sort of. <laughs> so yeah. you um, you've got anxiety. You're nervous. Go out and meet people. <laughs> oh, okay. That's a good idea. So this one is my number six is, a novella, but since we um, agree that novellas are stories, um, I, I went with this one. And of course, I'm going to have a Philip K. Dick story on here. I do the Dickheads podcast. So, um, but I think um, Second Variety by um, Philip K. Dick is um, an absolute banger classic horror story, science fiction story. Um, it is one of his all time greatest stories. It is a masterpiece of paranoia of um, in just insanity. Uh, um, and second variety is, if you don't know, is a post nuclear apocalypse, world war three story. And there's a squad of soldiers and there are these robots that are sent to kill them. But then possibly there's, another design, a second type of robot that um, changes the game, uh, as it were. And this was adapted into a low budget movie in the 90s um, called Screamers um, that has was originally the original Screamers screenplay was written by Dan O'Bannon back when they thought they were going to have money. And if you get a chance to read the Dan O'Bannon script when they thought they were going to have money, it's a really incredible script too. Um, and also I should say that we wouldn't have Philip K. Dick, the phenomenon that we did without second variety because second variety was the story that got on Dan O'Bannon's radar. Mm -hmm. And the next one that he started developing was do androids dream of electric sheep. Had he not been developing that one, we might not have ever gotten blade runner because mm -hmm. it, that's the reason why 
Um, the people that eventually made Blade Runner had it on their radar was Dan O'Bannon going around Hollywood saying somebody should make this into a movie and not be faithful to it because it wouldn't make a good movie if he made it faithfully. But that's a whole nother thing. <laughs> so um, but yes, Screamers Second Variety is to me an absolute masterpiece. It's one of Philip K. Dick's best. If you don't think Philip K. Dick can write horror, I'm telling you his masterpiece is the three stigmata of Palmer Eldridge. And that is a cosmic horror story all day and on Sunday. So uh, Philip K. Dick writes horror uh, as well as science fiction.